Welcome, everybody. Um, we're so glad you're joining us for this Tuesday night conversation. Um, this is part of Paths to Understanding, formerly Neighbors in Faith, and, and also the Tracy Levine Center. And um, our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. Uh, tonight, I'm joined in conversation with Rabbi Jim Morrell, the Rabbi Emeritus of Temple B'na Torah, and, uh, B'nai Torah, and currently Rabbi of Bet Havarim in South King County. Hi, Jim. How you doing? Great to be here with you, Terry. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you for being on. And my name is Terry Kylo. I'm the Executive Director of uh, Paths to Understanding a Lutheran pastor, and uh, just so happy to be with all of you tonight. So Jim, how, how are you and your family doing, and how are you faring during this, uh, this really challenging time of COVID-19? Well, that's a question on everybody's mind. I have to say, I'm a pretty optimistic person, and I really do feel that I'm very blessed and doing pretty well. But I've come to realize one thing. This experience that we have of being isolated, which is unusual, for us, yeah. for me, it's the reality for a lot of people all the time. Yes. And uh, now I'm getting a deeper sense of empathy for people who live alone, people who are on the streets, people who don't have the social network that I do, because you begin to feel, what does it really feel like to be isolated? Mm -hmm. I'm very blessed. I'm, I'm in a home with my wife. You know, we share everything and, you know, we, we at least can, can be there for each other. But a lot of people don't have that, and a lot of people don't have that all the time, not just during these times. So I, in any, some ways, it's been a blessing to really empathize with people that I really couldn't really understand how they were feeling. But now I get a little bit better how it, how it feels to be alone and to be isolated. Yeah, you know, I think uh, you know, a lot of studies have shown that 50% of, of Americans are chronically lonely. Yes. And, uh, and I think that that's a, a big part of, of what leads people to be fearful of others is that they don't, they don't get to encounter people of different, uh, different cultural traditions, uh, wisdom traditions, um, but even just folk in their neighborhood, they just, don't, they just don't, don't have conversation much with them or have a deep sense of connection. And, and what the brain researchers tell us is that, that that shifts our brain chemistry so that we become more suspicious of other people. It's absolutely true, and that you know people get cynical and they get and they they have the sense of putting up a wall around it themselves, and sometimes it's something that the outside world puts around them, sometimes yeah. they put it around themselves so it's um it's a real learning experience for us, and uh, we don't want this this crisis to go on very long, but we don't know yeah, but at the end of it, I think personally, I will come out a, a better person. Uh, and, and to have a deeper empathy and understanding about my fellow human beings. Yeah, I know for myself, uh, we, I, we live in a little neighborhood here and, and a little cul-de-sac, a couple of cul-de-sacs. And um, I've been going around knocking on doors and then stepping back, you know, a, a ways and trying to check in with neighbors. And what's been beautiful is so many of the people in our neighborhood are doing that. Good. So, it's, so ironically, some of the people who've been most lonely, I think, in our neighborhood are now realizing that they have people who will go to the store for them. That is a great gift. You know, so I, 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 I think that that, that that sense of empathy for people that, that are just not able to get out and don't have those connections, I, I really appreciate that, that your heart and mind go there um, right now during this crisis. And um, I'm, I'm just also interested, you know, how your, how your community is doing. Um, you know, I know we've got, we have a Passover coming up. Uh, you know, how are you all planning on handling that? How are you handling all the relationships with people in the congregation that are not able to be together right now? How's all that going? Well, this is a really amazing story, and I'm sure that hundreds of thousands of rabbis, imams, pastors will tell you the same story. Just this past week, we started doing online service. You know, we had to take a little while to get there. Yeah. In the beginning of March, we did have a service when we were together, but yeah. we were beginning to feel anxiety. And then the <laughs> governor came out and said, no, we can't do it anymore. Yeah. People were resistant. I said, listen, we have to go to that next level. We don't want to. So this past Friday night, and you can talk about your own experience also, we did have that first Zoom service. 
Yeah. And there was a lot of things that we learned. We were, I, I said, it's a learning curve. And I said, don't let the perfect defeat the good. It's, not <laughs> it's going to yes. be all right. Yes. But people can't, I, we did try to do some unison reading together. It didn't sound, you know, it's, there's a delay. Yeah. And people, and people have to put their, their thing on mute. But I was able, because we're not a large congregation, to say, all right, Susan, why don't you read now on page 43? We made sure that everybody have the prayer book. We got, right. them. We got them the prayer book. That was good. Right. I said, why don't you read? Unmute yourself. Read. And, you know, and it did work out pretty well. It, there, was, there was something about it. Of course, it's not the ideal. The first thing I said was, this is not normal. It's not the new normal. It's never going to be normal. It doesn't feel right. Yeah. We as Jews love being together, praying together. I'm sure it's true with Christians and Muslims and everyone. Being in in that holy space together, but since we can't do it, let's at least do this. And we're gonna do it again this Friday. And for Passover, um, it's gonna be now. The one thing about Passover, which is interesting, it's not a synagogue-based holiday. It is in right. the home, right? So it may we will do it. We'll be in our home, but we do have a group of people, and we'll do the Zoom. We'll try it out, but people can celebrate in their home with their immediate family so it in that way passover may be not such a great stretch but we're all learning and i appreciate believe me what you're doing because you're going beyond you know your own your own comfort zone to interfaith the people that you're reaching out to and that's what path to understanding is all about so i'm very honored to be part of this conversation well thank you thank you so much jim i know i i'm i'm participating just a little bit in the care of a congregation in between pastors. Well, that's good. And I, I know this last weekend, you know, we were all set. Uh, the previous weekend, we put a Facebook Live uh, live uh, worship service together, and it was very easy, and everything worked. And then the second Sunday, we did this uh, this Facebook Live thing. I thought it was going to be a piece of cake, and everything broke, and nothing worked, and I had to do it from my phone. And um, but that's just where everybody's at right now. And I and what people said in the responses uh, to, to both of those worship services, which again are not normal, they're, no. and, but, but, but they appreciated hearing those familiar words, engaging in conversation and being reminded of their connection. Uh, because even when we're not in a, a, our sacred space you know, with each other, we're still connected. Absolutely. But we, but we have to be reminded of that. We need some reminders to help us, uh, help us keep that in our consciousness. And when we do get back to that place, hopefully soon, when we're back in the church and we're yeah. back in the temple, we're back in the mosque and we're together, I think we'll have a greater appreciation. Isn't it great to be together? You know, you used to take that for granted, but yes. you have to actually be with people. And we might have a, we might have a slightly different approach. We might... Oh, you yeah. know, not hug as much. We'll have to see how it goes. We I mean, I, I hope that we will get back to that physical, you know, giving yeah. up the peace, right? And and and, yes. and hu uh, hugging and shaking hands. We'll have to see what the what the scientists tell us because we have to follow what the scientists tell us. But right. I hope we're going to get back to that uh, before long. I hope so too. I, I'm reminded last week of of Imam Kyrie's um, re re remark that that uh, in Islam, um, human beings are more important than Islam is. Right. You know, and I, and, and that was like, uh, that's been, I've been thinking about that all week long. Um, and, and I think, uh, I think all the, all those in the, all the leaders, the great leaders in the Abrahamic tradition would agree with that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It's so important. And, you know, the brotherhood, the sisterhood of humanity, and it's really the people and, um, it's something that we have to keep in mind, but it's, um, we also have to be real realistic and yes. there are people who are hurting and, you know, yes. we can only do so much. And I think of the doctors, the nurses, you know, yes. people in my family who are out there every day, putting their lives, lives on the line. And you yes. read about it in the newspaper and the bottom line is that not everyone's going to survive. We will lose people. We have lost thousands. We might lose hundreds of thousands. And, yes. and um, that's tough, tough things to face. And it's not, you know, being old. A lot of young people are, are, are dying too. So it's, uh, it's, it's really goes back to like the, 
the dark ages, the middle ages, you know, the plague came and, you know, and we know more about viruses than they do, but we yes. don't know how to cure the virus. And we don't know exactly how it gets transmitted. And we don't know why one person gets it and another person doesn't. And why one person survives and another person doesn't. Yes. So we, we, have a, we don't know that much. We're still, we're still in the dark ages in that regard. Yeah. And then if we, you know, as, and, and to follow along, you know, with your line of thought here, you know, there are so many populations in our society that are made much more vulnerable because yeah. of, the, of the social inequity, the economic inequity um, within our larger culture. And you think about people who are unhomed. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I, I cannot express how, 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 what, what an advantage I have that I have a home. What happens if I were to, if I were to be unhomed and, and get this virus, how would I, how would I sustain myself? And we have, uh, you know, you know, different, uh, different groups in, in prison in nursing homes. Um, there's all kinds of folk out there that are, that are made much more vulnerable to this. Um, I'm even thinking about those that, that don't have uh, citizenship in this country. Uh, definitely. And, right. And we, we have this, this large bill that was passed, uh, you know, to give out, you know, some money to people while the economy is, is, is basically being not quite halted, but slowed down dramatically. And many of those folk are not going to be able to, to benefit from that and will become even in a more vulnerable situation. Absolutely. Although I would say one thing about this disease, this virus, this plague, yes. it does strike rich and poor alike. It does. And, uh, and that's also an important lesson, you know. See, like Prime Minister, you know, Boris Johnson and other celebrities were getting it. So it's um, no one's immune from it. And you can try to be careful and wash yes. your hands, but somehow some people are going to get it. And, um, and, it's really frightening because there is no medicine you can take. There is no cure. You, you can, you can last it out. You can yeah. get through it maybe, yeah. Yeah. but there's really nothing that they can do. And you know, the vaccine is quite a bit down the road. So yeah, it, it it's, it's, it's a wake up call to everybody. And whether we have, whether you're a person of faith or not, I mean, you're out, you, you feel like a little bit out there on your own. And um, yeah. that's a feeling that we have. Yeah, and that that, feel, that that basic feeling of human vulnerability, which I, I think, which I know we all share, I think sometimes we we postpone it or we put it aside or we label it other things. Um, you know, what what are some of the practices in the Jewish tradition that sort of help people grapple with that? You know, sense of vulnerability. Um, are, are there any you know prayer practices or or any or any perspectives that you might offer? Uh, from the Jewish perspective that might help uh, folk that might be listening tonight? Well, you know, there's sometimes these things do sound a little trite because, you know, you can say the words, but it's different, difficult to really get it inside of you. But yes, the Jewish tradition has always taught, live every day as if it were your last day. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to say, you are mortal. Wow. You don't know whether you'll have a tomorrow or not. So yeah. this is a day. So repent one day before you die and since you don't know what that day is you should be repenting every day you have yeah. to get right with god you can't wait for some time down the road because you have that sense of mortality yes. and you know it's, again it's just words but the idea is to really feeling that this this is your day this is the day that god has made let us be glad and rejoice in it but let's also do the hard work yeah let's make sure we we do the the righteous acts do the kindness do the repentance. We don't want to wait till tomorrow. And um, maybe that's kind of come home a little bit uh, more during this time that maybe this is, you know, you and I, we look healthy. We were, you know, you're young, I'm old, but the mm. fact is that, <laughs> um, you know, if we get this disease, no one can say two weeks from now, we, right. you know, we're so healthy now. Right. But two weeks from now, we can be lying in a hospital in a respirator and they say, no, this yeah. guy is not coming back. So we have to take him off the respirator. Right. And that's, 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 that's an equalizer. So that comes home. And we have to remember that we get up in the morning. Thank you for giving me another day. But uh, we don't know if it's just one more day or, you know, a thousand more days. We have no idea. 
You know, I, I think about in my own, you know, kind of growth as a, as a, as a, as a Christian, um, I've come to recognize that uh, a part of the Christian tradition, which of course grows out of the Jewish tradition, is this, um, is this notion that, um, that, uh, that, we, we, that, that we can learn to embrace human life, to embrace our own life, even within the context of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. and, and that because as, as the Hebrew tradition, uh, as the Hebrew scripture says, um, after God ends up creating everything, behold, it is very good. Absolutely. And, and then in the Christian tradition, as I think I might have said last week, that the idea is that, um, is that, is that um, and this is maybe the best of, of Christianity here, is that, is that um, God becomes a human in Jesus for Christians yes. in order to affirm the good and very goodness of the creation. Yeah, I like that. So, That's a very strong point. So, so it isn't, it isn't uh, 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 the first time it was said, <laughs> right? Um, but, uh, but it, but, but it, it, I, I, for me, that's what resonates in me. And then learning to embrace my own vulnerability, learning to embrace my own capabilities is a lot of what I think the Christian tradition, as well as the, is my love and care for my neighbor, is a lot of what the tradition's there to do. And that's true. I think that's true with all, all the world's religion, whether they're the Abrahamic religions or the Eastern religions, they all have that sense of we're connected. We're connected and we are, we are responsible for our, for our own lives, but we're also responsible for other people and for animals as well. So it's the, the idea that the, the life is sacred. Yes. We live in a, in a holy place and yes. it's a gift and a gift, you know, like sometimes you give back, you have to give it back. And the day comes when you give back that gift of life, but you <laughs> hopefully have another life ahead of you in the world to come. And that's, just, that's also faith. Yes. Well, my, my dad died in, in early November, um, uh, soon after All Saints Day. Um, uh, and he, um, I went to visit him in Spokane. Um, and, uh, you know, he knew when I showed up at midnight you know, that things were, were moving along. And I told him that he did a very good job as a father and as a, as a husband and uh, that I was very proud of him, you know. And, uh, and he said, and this is the quote that he gave, he said, it was a good life. You know, he said, he said, it was a hard life sometimes, but it was a good life and I'm grateful. That's beautiful. That's where he ended up. And I think, you know, isn't that what all of our traditions are trying to help us help us get to <laughs> yeah you know we, if your dad got there be, and you know there is a gift to know that that death is approaching i mean because not not everybody has that gift some people go very suddenly and yes. they have a chance to really say their goodbyes but yes. in the case of your dad he he knew his time was coming and you gave him a chance to express himself yes and, you know that's a gift too it doesn't not for everybody because right. a lot of people go very quickly and we, you mm -hmm. know moments of tragedy but yes that was a beautiful thing and and you heard it and made it made you feel better too right of course of course and and it and it, it taught me something you know about about how to handle my own vulnerability you know uh, a bit too um, that's even carrying with me through this through this uh, this this crisis here uh, but, you know, it's not all of us handle our anxiety directly, you know, Jim, none of us try to handle it consciously. Um, and we've seen some attempts uh, by some by some people in this country, some of some of our leaders even uh, for naming this virus and kind of blaming people in its country of origin. Yeah, that's that is unfortunate. I mean, we can we can definitely be critical of a lot of things that we see coming out of Washington, D.C. and one of the things that we have to say is not appropriate is to say blame is putting blame on a whole culture, a whole nation. Yes. Um, that's, that's not going to be helpful. It's not helpful. And it, and the, the thing about this virus, it does teach us, you know, things happen. There's no blame. There's, there's no, you can't point your finger at it. Yep. And if you try to name it, then you're, you're going down the wrong path. And, so that's something we have to speak out against. You know, I'm, I'm a person, I don't like to talk politics 
from the pulpit, yeah. but I, and or name by name, you know, some people I don't agree with, but I could definitely call out ideas that are wrong. Yes, yes. and uh, certainly blaming a culture or a or a geographical place. That's certainly not the way to go. And frankly speaking, nobody knows. Nobody knows where this came from. That's and it, right. and you know and you know people say, well, you know, God, God is well, God is responsible for everything. So I, I have no problem with saying God is trying to teach us a lesson. Well, that's for God to say. I don't I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Whether God is trying to teach us a lesson or not, there are lessons to be learned even in the worst of search yes. circumstances. And so that may be true that everything's a lesson from God right. and that's, that may be true, but, and then, and like they say, I think Shakespeare, you know, every, uh, it might've been John Donne for, for every tra every cloud, there is silver lining and there are some silver linings that come from this, uh, situation. There's no, there's absolutely no doubt about it. Greater appreciation for, for what we have, greater appreciation for the freedoms that we have yes. put aside for a little while. Yeah. Greater appreciation for medical science, even though it's imperfect. Yeah. And greater appreciation for those who are, you know, giving of themselves every day and putting their lives on the lines. You think about people, you know, the military, you think about the fire people, mm -hmm. uh, police. But now we realize it's a lot of the person working in the grocery store is putting his self or her self on the line yes. just to be there to, to serve us. And, you know, well, people are doing what they have to do. You can't, you know, not, some people are essential. And now we realize that a lot of people are essential. Maybe yeah. everybody is. Yeah. And, and, you know, people who are caregiver, caregivers for, for folk that are elderly. I mean, all those folk are, are just doing incredible work and are, and, you know, what I hope that we can have is a conversation about, about adequately compensating people for the, for the care that they offer, you know, every, every single day. So I, I like this conversation to shift just a little bit now. I, I know that you've been a, a leader in, in many interfaith uh, conversations and relationships around Seattle, the Seattle area for many years. Um, you know, why did you spend time and energy on that? What was your motivation for doing that, Jim? Well, I think my first motivation was, you know, to, be, to become a rabbi was to serve God, but also to serve our own community. Yeah, our own Jewish community. But then I realized really early on, and particularly when I came to Seattle 46 years ago, oh. and, and Rabbi Levine was a big mentor for me, yes. that one of the things we have to do is to break down the barriers. And there are so many barriers between people. And, you know, we as Jews have had a lot of prejudice directed towards us, but we yes, recognize it goes both ways. And there are other people that are having the same issues. So if we can reach out beyond our own circle uh, to broaden that circle and let people know that we're just like them. Mm -hmm. And that was really important. And so I, you know, I'm definitely standing on the shoulders of a lot of people who've come before, Father Tracy and yes. Rabbi Levine. And they were really wonderful exemplars of reaching out and not just talking about it, but really walking together and doing things together and mm -hmm. it's yeah that's that's the um that's the path that i'm trying to to follow I'm not setting my own path and following their path well i know and i know that you've been and we'll talk more about you know rabbi levine and maybe father tracy here in a few minutes but yeah um you know where why do you um why do you um i know that you've been a part of an interfaith group in bellevue um that's that's been around for quite some time. In fact, some of the members of that contacted me this last week and said to say hello to you, um, and we're we're grateful that you're going to be on tonight. Um, what are what are the gifts of those relationships to those faith communities that have gathered and been together for so many years? What I've found is that we can be there for each other. Now, nine eleven was a big turning point because. The natural response for a lot of people, and understandable, this, these were Muslims. This was the Islamic attack in the United States. And we saw that right away. And it was true that they, they were a handful of Muslims sure. who did it. 
Sure. But we wanted to say, you know, we can we don't want to extrapolate to from a handful of people to a billion people. Yeah. And we reached out to our Muslim neighbors right away and, yeah. and they responded. And we said, we want to be there for you. And then over the next many years, uh, we've been recipro reciprocated. When we were attacked and we had the shooting, the Jewish Federation, they stood up for us. So yeah. it was something that we had to, we, we count on each other. It's not just transactional. You, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. No, it yeah. means that we really do love each other. Yeah. And I've come to love my, some of uh, my Christian brothers and sisters, fellow clergy, Muslim brothers and sisters, and consider them like, like family. But we know that when we're, when we're attacked, we have people who stand up for us. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's important. But it's really a matter of really have a, not just uh, caring, but it's really loving. It's a loving thing. And yet, you know, get back to Father Trace and Rabbi Levine. That was their, that was their word, love. Love yeah. for each other. But right. it's walking together and, um, and when, the, when the chips are down. We also want to do things when, you know, normal time. Yeah. Not these kind of times. Yeah, that's, that's right. We did like every Thanksgiving, yeah. Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, and yeah. we still do it. We yeah. got interfaith Thanksgiving service. Oh, I might say, well, it's just symbolic, you know, people getting together to feel good. Yeah. But it creates a real sense of community. And going one year at the, at the Catholic Church, one year at, we're at the Lutheran Church, one year at yeah. the Bible. And it's just, it's been, that was one of the greatest parts of, my life at Temple Venator in Bellevue because you know, it, we're neighbors and we, you know, within, you know, a few blocks of each other, we're worshiping separately most of the time, yeah. but coming together on occasion. Um, another story was that when we came to Bellevue from Mercer Island, our congregation moved, we walked with our Torah scrolls from Mercer Island. It was a little rainy as it usually yeah. is. We, yeah, yeah. We, we made it. We yeah. got there eight miles from Mercer Island. We walked with the Torah scrolls. But the greatest thing to our new building, it was a brand new building, wasn't even totally finished. But we walked into the, uh, walked up to our building. And who was there? All of our neighbors. Wow. The churches waiting for us. to That's us. beautiful. And I said, come on in. You know, we, we, I, building not quite done, but let's say a few prayers together. Yes. And, and that that image of you know walking then and then when we get there to this new neighborhood that you know they're waiting for us that's beautiful and, and that was a that was one of the great moments of of my life as the rabbi well you know some some people are afraid you know i uh, I know that I was like this for a while in my in my life uh, as well, even as a pastor was I was afraid that if I engage with people from different traditions that I would end up, you know, like it's sort of losing my own Christian identity in some way. Um, how, how do you respond to people with that kind of fear? Well, I think it's, I think it's normal. I think it's a yeah. normal thing. You don't, sure. you want to say, I, I don't want to go so far beyond who I am. I don't want to, I don't want to become the other. Yeah, that's right. I want it. So the first thing you do is really be proud, centered in your own identity. Mm -hmm. I am a Jew. I'm always going to be a Jew. I yeah. love my tradition. And yeah. w the thing that I've said in these interfaith um, meetings and services and times, I always say, you know, Christianity is the best religion for Christians. Islam <laughs> is the best religion for Muslims. Yeah. And Judaism is the best religion for Jews. Yeah. And you know, we should be proud of who we are. It's the yeah. best it is the best religion for us because that's who yeah. we are. Yeah. And we would affirm it. Now I'm not saying that there aren't occasions where someone gets a moment and they move from one to the other and the you know, conversion is part of the deal too. Sure, of course. And I've seen evangelical Christians say to me, you know, I love you and yeah, I would love for you to be a Christian. You know, that's who I am. I, you know, I'm evangelical, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want you to be a Christian, but I love you as you are, and that's fine. I say, it's fine. Well, you keep, you keep, keep preaching, that's fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll listen to what you say, and I, you know, maybe I'll learn something. I don't think I'll become a Christian, but, you know, I, I can listen. Judaism, you know, we don't, we don't preach to convert, but we want people to know who we are. And, mm. and, and I have done in my lifetime as a rabbi, I have done 
uh, dozens of conversions of people who were either didn't have unchurched, as they say, or maybe they just looking for something different. So that's, that's, that is a possibility. That's not our goal, but we don't right. want to turn people away either, but mm -hmm. that's fine. But generally say, be proud of who you are. And even if you decide not to be a Christian anymore, not to be a Jew anymore, mm -hmm. at least know what you're giving up. Yeah. Come from a place of knowledge, know who you are. Maybe right. it doesn't work for you, but I think that it usually does. Right. So, you know, thinking back about Rabbi Levine, who's really, whose insight and action, you know, led to challenge to challenge the challenge program in the 1960s and 70s, um, led to the, the, the imagination of getting youth together from different traditions Yeah. Um, up at Camp Brotherhood um, and who with uh, Father Tracy helped found the Camp Brotherhood and then the Tracy Levine Center and now Paths to Understanding. I, I'm just interested to hear your perspective and about like, you know, their core insights and, and what they sort of help teach you. Well, you know, just, just the example, just to look at them, just to listen to them, just to walk with them. And I've heard the stories many different times from them and also read about it. So they wrote the books. Yeah. And, um, they were people from totally different backgrounds. I mean, yes. they came from totally different backgrounds, different understanding, very, to they were into their faith very much. And uh, Father Tracy, God bless him, you know, 100 yeah. years plus, you know, he yeah. came, from came from Ireland and, uh, and Rabbi Levine came from Russia. You know, uh, he came as a, as, a, as a baby, but you know, Father Tracy came as, as you know, a young priest. And he come to a new country and have to learn all new things and try to figure it all out. But they were they were thrown together by by fate, I might say by God. Yeah. Because Rabbi Levine had this vision. Let's have a a dialogue, mm -hmm. a, a regular dialogue, a program, you know, a radio program and television program. And uh, you know, I give him a lot of credit. He, you know, he was maybe was inspired by some of his teachers too. Right. He, was, he, was, he was born in 1900 and he was educated. He was a lawyer. He was a rabbi. You know, he, he didn't invent it either, but he was yeah. inspired. Came sure. to Seattle after, you know, in the World War II. And he said, you know, after World War II, the Holocaust, we have so much work to do. Yeah. And we have to, um, and the best way to do it, he thought, was to break down the barriers. Yeah. So he went to the archbishop, who was I don't I don't remember his name, but not important. He, he said, you know, archbishop, I'd like to do this program. The archbishop was pretty reluctant. Oh, bad. Because, because in those <laughs> days, uh, and I'm you're not from the Roman Catholic tradition, I, and I love the Roman Catholic tradition. Yeah. There was a lot of barriers. Yes. You know, even sure. Roman Catholics could not even go to another church or not or certainly to a temple they weren't even permitted to go so right. this would be this was before you know uh you know, pope, pope john the 23rd this was before yes. vatican ii yeah he said you know let's let's give it a try ultimately he he got the archbishop to agree he said so send me send me a priest give me a priest to work with and <laughs> yeah. he sent this young guy yeah. who was so much younger than rabbi levine yes. just kind of fresh out of the uh, yes. uh, the seminary, and you know, he said, "I don't know." It's, it's so, <laughs> so green. Yeah. But that was the turning point in Rabbi Levine's life because mm -hmm. he learned so much from Father Tracy. Yes. And Father Tracy, as you know, yes, has that way about him. He had that 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 wisdom. I'm sure he even had it as a young man. Yes. And that uh, that also that sparkle that irish sparkle in his eye you know yes. he can kind of win you over very easily absolutely i think he won over rabbi levine and, and together and uh, aki rolander from the uh yes. from lutheran church but right they, they created something that was very special now it's ironic because the work that we're doing the work that you're doing yeah you know so many people never met rabbi levine you know it's been 30, 35 years you know whole generation who, yeah it, they may never heard of him and they certainly never saw him. Yeah. So it, to talk about somebody, you know, kind of as an icon, but you didn't know him, but I did know him and certainly father Tracy and Aki and those others. And, um, so we're, we're building on what they, what they, 
created and they created something special, but they knew it was also a lot of work. Yeah. And it can't just be the, right. The ministers and the, pa- and the priests and the rabbis it's gotta be grassroots. So yes. I'm going to challenge you, Terry, and say, listen, yeah. you've ta- you got a big, a lot of big shoes to fill, right? <laughs> <laughs> but path to understanding yeah. it's going to work. If you can get it down to the grassroots, you can go to the, right. go into the, into the, into the pews and you say you know i'm gonna it's it's this is what we're trying to do and break down the, it sometimes it's misunderstanding sometimes it's more than mis- misunderstanding sometimes it's really yeah. antipathy and hatred that's a tough job but i'm glad that you're the guy doing it because i really believe that you are the you're the guy who's been anointed you know just like Alicia. well you know i yeah i mean it's it's uh it's um it's hard work sometimes. I, I've been in over a hundred congregations now. Amazing. Um, helping, uh, helping to sort of take people through um, their kind of their help, help people, help people recognize some of the, even the unknown anxiety about others that they didn't even know they had. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then, and then begin to help them tool up. Like, so it passed to understanding we're going to be doing inspiring stories like, like we're doing tonight. We're going to be nurturing relationships and we're going to be helping people to act together because really at that local level, like you say, is where it needs to happen. Absolutely. Once people get, to, once they get to know each other, once they, they, they begin to, to love each other and recognize that, that engaging the other helps them become uh, more committed and more clear about their own religious tradition. Um, all of us, and that they can act together for the common good. Um, then I think we really have, uh, we can really work through this challenge we have right now of how do we deal with, 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 with each other, given the fact that we have different cultures and traditions. And that's a big question for us right now. One thing that we did, and you know, there's a lot of different models, but one thing that we did right after 9-11, we got the, the Muslim, Christian, and Jewish communities together out there in, in Bellevue. And we said, all right, what do we need to do and I give credit to some of the lay people. I mentioned a guy named Phil Gerson from our congregation. He said, we better, oh, yeah. do, we better do something together. So to, they, we came up with an organization called Together We Build. And we said, we're going to build houses, Habitat for Humanity. Now, yeah. Habitat for Humanity, up to that point, was a Christian organization out of Georgia, you know, mm-hmm. Jimmy Carter. And, they, and they, they themselves were a little bit reluctant. They said, we've always been a Christian organization. They said, no. We're going to build together. We want to work through your organization. So no, out there, no. Palmy, we were out there for the next several years, hammers and, you know, learning, and we built houses together through Habitat, no. and that's a great organization, by the way. It is. And uh, that was really when we learned how to work together. We, and they had, we ate together out there. We, had, we brought food out to the, to the work site. And building things together, so that was, you know, it was maybe it was somewhat symbolic, but it was work, was real houses that we built, sure. and it lasted for a few years. And we got that was we had a sense we had, we had a common a common uh, project and, and destiny. And when, and when we dedicated the houses, we did it, you know, together. And we had a little service. Yes. And I have to give credit to Habitat for Humanity because they grew through through that experience. Oh yeah, Jews and Muslims. Could also build houses together. <laughs> so, um, you know, you'll come up with your own model, uh, Terry, with the, you know, path to understanding what you're going to do. It, it, it could be feeding, it could be housing, it could be a number of things. But, and, and certainly the Christian church has been exemplary about doing things in the third world. And, you know, some of it's, it's missionary work, but it's also going out there and building houses and, and, you know, uh, bringing running water so it's it's out there it, the models are there well I, I i think honestly like our our model will be to help help people imagine what what their community needs and learn how to do that together yeah following very much the same pattern that you all followed i've i've met phil before i i love him he's great um yeah i hope he's listening right now maybe <laughs> <laughs> shout out to phil so um <laughs> So I, I, I want to go theological just for a minute. And, you know, the work that I've been doing uh, around uh, engaging with people of other traditions has led me to reflect a lot about monotheism mm-hmm. and what it was, 
what that core insight of monotheism or there, there being one creator, what that core ins insight implies and what it's, what it's kind of trying to teach us. And I'd love to hear from you as a, as a rabbi, you know, you know, what you think the core insights of monotheism are. Well, first of all, we want to say that we don't want to take all the credit because, you know, we, we may have been the first tradition to come up with that idea. We're not sure. Yeah. But we, one of the things that we are very justifiably proud of is that we have these sister religions of Christianity and Islam that we do feel that we gave that gift to uh, those two traditions. And it's something that we do share together called Abraham, Abrahamic tradition but really is that faith that faith in that one universal creative yes and creation the creator god and the basic reality of that is that there is not us and them mm -hmm. you know it's yeah. we are together and when we go back to genesis you know we are all descendants of that mythic adam and eve you know we're all yeah. we truly are brothers and sisters we're, and we're also one with the, with the universe, the earth, the animals, and all of creation. So that's the greatest thing, because when you have many gods, then my God is better than your God. Mm -hmm. And we go, to, we go to war. Now, war is a deep part of the human tradition. And we have to realize it goes back to primates. Yeah. We're not going to probably eliminate war from the earth. We'd love to do it. We like the vision of peace. Mm -hmm. But if we can just remember that, even at the worst moments, we are all one creation. And that one God is our father, mother. The God is, you know, is we're all connected. So yeah. we look at each other and, and the Eastern traditions have that too. You know, we look, I see God in you. Yes. You see God in me. We greet each other with that understanding. And, you know, Jacob and Esau, even though they had their 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 problems they said when i see you i see the face of god and you know that's yeah. that, you now i see you i see the face of god but yeah. it's only because there is one god right and, it, and we're not we're we're together we're one and uh that's a beautiful gift and christianity has its own understanding of god and islam has its own understanding but it's really one god that's why i'm not when i'm with with muslims i i say I use the word Allah because Allah yeah. is is Allah is just the Arabic word for God. Yeah. And if that's where they're comfortable with, I have that we have no problem with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we, we use God, we have Creator, Lord, many different names of God, but there's one there is one God. And yeah. that's that's our that's our deepest faith. We say Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. God is one. Hero Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai, Echad, one. So the oneness is the whole thing, unity. And that's, you know, Rabbi Levine was, you know, very, very clear about that. And, uh, and that's, that's who we are. So I'm glad you asked me about that. Well, it's, it's been, so like, I, I just want to say, I, I grew up in a, in a small Christian congregation in Eastern Washington State, and they're lovely people. Like, they loved me well. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I want to say that there, that I think I walked out of there and it, some of it may have been developmental, you know, what I was able to hear mm -hmm. not versus what they were speaking. And we all have to look at our own, our own developmental life and make sure we realize that people, our parents aren't always saying what we thought they were saying. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, same with our pastors or rabbis or imams. But what I walked away from there really feeling, and some of this is, it, it, was, was kind of part of white white Christian supremacy is not monotheism but mono religionism mm. that there's one religion but uh, and and we are the the only folk that really have access to the to the true God right mm. and everybody else is doing something false or wrong or or weird or whatever and so when I go to churches this is this is kind of part of what I say I say that monotheism was intended to help us recognize other people as human, mm -hmm. even if they're part of a different tribe or language or religion. Um, and so instead of having you know, our God, when we fight, there's our God fighting their God, there's now one God in heaven saying, stop fighting because you're all third cousins. 
Absolutely. And that what we've done, I think, and in, in, in some of this is perhaps human nature, is that we've retribalized monotheism. And so what I, what I tell people, and this is kind of a joke, is that uh, we've turned monotheism into the NFL, the National Faith League. <laughs> and this week it's going to be Moses versus Muhammad, and the following week it'll be the winner versus Jesus. And I think that Abraham and Sarah, I think Moses, uh, Jesus and Muhammad and all the other, all the prophets would be so upset to see us retribalizing monotheism and using it to dehumanize each other instead of recognizing our essential unity, which is what you spoke to. Yeah, I think I, I have to recognize that I, I have to recognize and accept that for many Muslims, they're, they believe that Muslim, the Islamic tradition, Islam is the ultimate of the faith. That's sure. the, because they're the last ones. Sure. Muhammad, you know, peace be yeah. upon him, as they always say, is the, is the seal of the prophets. There are no more prophets. And, you know, and Christians have that view that we are the way, the, the way, right? right? And maybe Judaism has that too, kind of built into it. Right. So I guess people will just say, I always say to people, well, when we when we get to heaven, we'll we'll find out. But while we're here on earth, let's let's all get along. Yeah. Um, and maybe maybe you're right. Maybe that that's what we'll find out. But yeah. right now, let's all try to get along a little bit better and at least respect each other. And if we can get from respect to not just tolerate, but to respect, respect to embrace, and from embrace to love, that would be the greatest thing. But you know, we have to realize we can't undo history and we have to live with history too and i i'm not trying to get muslims to be different than they are christians to be different than they are yeah they say if they say christianity is the the way i say all right that is i, I that's your belief i i respect you i'm yeah. not going to try to change your belief what you believe yeah. but you know ideally we, we can at least get to some place i think we all recognize that we are brothers and sisters that no question about it but maybe you know you can change your brother into a christian all right <laughs> that's yeah. all i can try for but at, well, least, uh, at least we're brothers and sisters well that's right and i so there, there are kind of two things that happen in in churches um one is uh people will say to me well you know jews and muslims aren't christian and so I'll say that's true. There's about 5 billion folk on the, on the planet that currently are not Christian. Yeah. And, uh, but the question is, are we? And they'll, they'll say, well, yes. And I say, okay, well, how did Jesus respond to people uh, from different racial or ethnic, cultural, and religious traditions? What did he do? What did he propose to us about, what did he teach about how we respond to neighbor? Who is our neighbor? Right. And so, um, you know, basically when I'm asked that question about, well, you know, uh, don't we kind of have it figured out, you know, I will just simply, I'll try to lean them and take them straight to the teaching of Jesus. That's a great way. You go to your own teaching and That's say, right. let's look at what, let's look what our, what our own tradition is teaching us. That's right. And uh, if you can do that, you're, you're going to be lifting those people up. Yeah. Because Jesus uh, had an opportunity to build an alliance uh, at one point when there was a conflict between Samaritans and some Jewish folk, right? And exactly. he, could, he, he could have built unity with, with his own folk by scapegoating and othering uh, Samaritans. Instead, he chose to tell a positive story about them. Exactly. Indicating that, that their tradition allowed that, allowed, you know, the, their, the image of God that was placed in them to shine forward and love and care for someone stuck alongside a road. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. And you know, what you say is really very wise. If you just tell the Christians, you know, that, that Jewish neighbor, think of him as a Samaritan. <laughs> no, right? He's, yes. he's a Samaritan. What do you yes. get? You leave him by, you know, you leave him by the side of the road or see your neighbor. He's yeah. a Samaritan, you know, if yes. Jesus can love the Samaritan, you better love that Samaritan too. So I, I, I embrace that. I say, all right, I'm, I'm a Samaritan, and mm -hmm. I know that if I'm, if, if I'm in need, and Jesus was walking by, he, he'd be reaching out to me. So why don't yeah. you do it too? Well, you know, it's so part of that story. I mean, just to lean into that a little bit, 
um, when Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, it's not necessarily that it, it happened. Um, he was asked a question about who is my neighbor. And there, exactly. there is this thing in human beings that we want to kind of limit, you know, who our neighbor is. And I'm not denying that we also have to care for ourselves and our own families and that we don't have, you know, priorities, right? Yeah, I, think, right. I think we do. Um, and I, I've, learned, I've learned that more from, from my rabbi friends than I have from my Christian friends, that it's okay to have priorities. Um, but I, but I, when Jesus is asked that question, um, someone's trying to limit who, who is human, who is, who his neighbor is. And so the story isn't about how Jesus was good to a Samaritan. It was about the possibility of a Samaritan being good to exactly. one of his own people. Exactly. So he's saying, he's telling a story, the parable, listen, yeah. that Samaritan was a generous person. So you, you know, you can be generous back. So that's exactly. a good point. So it's, uh, it's really saying that we're all going to be by the side of the road at one time or another. Yes. And we, and we want to make sure that yes. the person walking by will see us as worthy as a neighbor. It doesn't matter what the title, what the, what the, uh, in the name, it doesn't matter what the title, what the identity, that's yeah. neighbor, neighbor to neighbor. And, you know, I don't have to tell you, but Jesus quoted the Torah. Yes. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love yes. your neighbor as yourself. But the, the important thing about that is to be able to de to define neighbor. Yes. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you think your neighbor, really in Hebrew, maybe your neighbor is not the best. It means your fellow, your fellow as yourself, mm -hmm. the one who's who's other than you, and yes. that should be as broad as we possibly can. Yes. It certainly should include every other human being, and maybe even beyond human beings to other life forms and animals too. But yeah, it, it, that's a critical thing. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that's Leviticus 19. It's also, you know, New Testament as well. It's a quotation. So we yeah. stick with that. Yeah. And on those two, you know, uh, you know, as Jesus is very, is very clear in, 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 is that on those two, uh, you know, hang all the law and the pro everything else flows from that. Yeah. When we would agree with that 100%. Two, yeah. two quotations from the Bible. Love your God with all your heart, you know, soul, might, yes. and love your neighbor as yourself. Two you know, two quotations from the Torah, and Jesus was quoting his Jewish tradition, and he's saying these are the two most important. And the and the rabbis of his generation said the same thing yeah. that there are certain commandments that are higher because they encompass all the other ones. Yes. And loving God and loving others, that that's the essence of being a, a Jew, a Christian, a Muslim, a good person. Indeed. And and the other bits vote. Other commandments are important too because they get down to the specifics of how we do it. Right. And, um, you know, they don't, the traditions we love, I mean, Christians love, you know, celebrating Christmas because that's, that's a beautiful holiday, it reminds sure. us of who we are. We love Passover. Yeah. You know, we love Passover because that's who we are. It tells our story. We have to tell our story. We all have stories to tell. You have a story, personal story, but you have your, communal yes. story right yes. and that's what you know the, the, the passion is your communal story we have passover and so well, we're looking forward to a good week next week it's going to be a holy week it's going to be a different kind of holy week right it will it's going, be, it's going to be a different kind of holy week but we can christians can still celebrate easter they can yes. celebrate the resurrection yes. we can still celebrate passover we can celebrate the redemption Yes. Because it doesn't matter whether we're in the church or the synagogue or in our home. And, you know, that, that great quotation, you, know, where you can pray even in a little closet. You go in closet, you can pray. So it, it, shouldn't, it, it will be different. And it'll, and it'll be kind of, it might be a little bit uh, not as joyous as we'd like. Because we won't be with our, we won't be able to be with our, our larger group. Yeah. But we'll still be together. Well, and hopefully, you know, those, 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 those two basic teachings that, that there's, you know, one creator and that we're called to love each other. And of course, love doesn't mean have warm feelings. It means to work for the well-being of our neighbor. Absolutely. Which I think Christians sometimes, frankly, um, you know, need to work on our definitions. Uh, we all, we all need it. It's not just Christians. Uh, <laughs> I, not get all, we're, all, we're all working on it. Yeah. I, 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 I always believe in talking trash about my own people. <laughs> well, you know, you get, 
self-criticism is a good thing, but yes, it is. Us, but we also have to realize that we're all, yes. we're, we all have a long way to go and um, we, we can appreciate the other, but we, we all, have, we all have work to do. And okay. um, we, we Jews and um, I know Muslims also are very much in that regard. Yes. Repentance well, is a big part of our tradition. Yes. Trying to do better. We do, and we do make mistakes. No one's perfect. So yes. we're not going to be perfect. Well, and that's the, that's the thing. One of the things I respect the most about the Hebrew tradition is that, is that, is that the Jewish tradition remembers its own self-critique and lifts up different voices. And I would love sometime, we'll, we'll talk again, I'd love to talk about that. And I would also love to talk about, about, uh, you know, some of the, uh, of the, of the understandings of, of Jesus life and death and resurrection that, that um, have been, have been harmful, frankly, um, in sort of setting up some, some, some real um, bias against our Jewish neighbors. I'd love to talk to you about that, but but for now, uh, we need to bring this conversation to a close. So Rabbi Jim, I'm just so thankful uh, to have had this time with you and thankful to everybody that's, that's, that's watched. And um, I think next week we may be rebranding this to be Wisdom from the Neighborhood. Um, remember, you can find out more about us at pathtounderstanding.org. Um, we'll be having a Challenge 2.0 episode on Thursday night on Facebook, doing a watch party on our, on our, on our Facebook channel. You can always go to our YouTube channel at Paths to Understanding and watch one of the 52 episodes that are there. And we just wish you all uh, really uh, th the best. Be well, uh, be calm, and be good to your neighbors. Thank you all for watching. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. <laughs>